Welcome to the Deep Dive and welcome to Inside Texas Football, powered by InsideTexas.com. Hey, right now we are running a special deal. One dollar for seven days and 50 percent off your first year. What a deal. Join Inside Texas today. Join the best community. We're talking the Longhorns, sports in general, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Ian, happy Thanksgiving, man. What's going on? Not much. We're going to have a Boyd Moot in North Austin tomorrow, Thanksgiving. What's your favorite way to do the meal? Like, what's your what's your go-to on your Thanksgiving plate? I'm a big stuffing guy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Stuffing is everything. Uh, our producer, Connor, loves green bean casserole. Okay. So, you know. Thank God he's good at production and other things because he's not very good at picking Thanksgiving meals and entree choices. I am a. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's fine, Connor. You're right. It's fine. He's pushing back. My uh, my go to the first thing I do is I get a roll or a biscuit, whichever is is offered to me, and I put the turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and gravy, and make a sandwich. Nice. And that's how I like to consume Thanksgiving with I. I, knowing you, I thought you were going to say a crescent roll dipped into mayonnaise. <laughs> I was like, you yeah. said crescent roll, and I was like, oh, sounds sounds pretty good. Sounds good. We've got something we want to dip into, and we promise it's going to be spicier than Ian's love of mayonnaise. Uh, we're going to talk Texas, Texas A&M. We're spe specifically going to talk matchups because – Really, I think this game is going to boil down to the play of the quarterbacks on each side of the ball. And I think that's going to inform how both offenses do against some defenses who may, in varying ways, pose problems for the opposing quarterback. So, Ian, are you ready to wade in? Yeah, I've uh, caught up a little bit on AM in the last couple of days, as I'm sure you have. And, as uh, have I. It, it's been hard to get a good – I haven't had a lot of reason to study them because they have not played in a lot of important games. Hmm. Well, that's a great lead in. One of the things that makes AM difficult to study is which AM. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The problem with stats, stats are great, but if you don't understand stats within context, you're using them the way a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. So, we're going to try to use stats for illuminative purposes here because if you take a mean average of Connor Wegman starting against Notre Dame and you blend it with when they had Levy on Moss and they're playing Florida and you blend it with their last game against Auburn, you're going to get a very deceptive mean, aren't you? So what we're going to try to do is talk about the fact that a and had three distinct offensive iterations. And this is something that I wrote about on Inside Texas. Aggie offense 1.0. Tried to feature NFL Draft Twitter's favorite prospect, Connor Wegman, in a balanced sort of spread passing offense. And Wegman didn't excel, did he? No. The Notre Dame game was particularly egregious. And then um, I feel like he had one – the Missouri game was solid. And then he, like, just collapsed again against LSU. I don't know what's up with that guy but it's over for him. So, Yeah, people keep making cards appear in his shoe, and it throws him off his game, and as it would anyone. I mean, it's understandable. So, yeah, that's AM offense number one, 1.0. AM offense number 2.0, that second iteration, is something Colin Klein is very familiar with, Ian. I'm going to get a mobile dual-threat quarterback. I'm going to get an excellent running back in Le'Veon Moss. And I'm going to have a number two running back in Amari Daniels, who's quite capable. And I'm going to run the heck out of the football. And then I'm going to let this quarterback get outside the pocket, take shots, take play action shots, and, of course, use his legs to elevate my running back. Uh, we know now it's been studied that if you've got a great running quarterback, your running back is the greatest beneficiary in terms of yards per carry simply because you get that extra man advantage. You've got to account for the quarterback. AM ran that offense with, with Marcel Reed, and they went 4-0 running that offense. They got big wins over the likes of Florida, Bowling Green, Arkansas, and LSU. 
four decent teams. Yeah, in, in their varying ways, decent teams. Yeah. Then something else happened. And now we have Texas A&M offense 3.0. Le'Veon Moss blew out his knee against South Carolina fairly early in that game. Yep. So, Wicked Marshall hit. Reed now has to go to another phase of the old Kansas State Colin Klein experience, which Colin Klein personally embodied, which is? Hero ball. And what I'm is hero, hero ball? ball? Hero ball is where I've tried to, I've actually tried to put a number on it before, but it's where your quarterback is running the ball 15 plus times a game, throwing the ball 30 plus times a game. And his usage rate is just like 60, 70, 80% of your offense. He's making a decision with the ball in his hands that isn't just hand to this guy on the majority of your plays. It's offloading, offloading a massive portion of offensive responsibility, not only in terms of workload, but decision-making to one player, the quarterback. Now, Texas fans are not unfamiliar with this concept. Sam Ellinger was the embodiment of hero ball in his time here at Texas. Uh, in fact, had a much higher usage rate than Vince Young, who's sort of the classic example. Colt McCoy, a lot of hero ball late in his career. Worked out for us. Uh, it helps if the guy's an actual hero, and it also helps if they're mature and physically capable of handling it, both mentally and physically. But let's look at Marcel Reed and how it's gone for him. It's also, sorry, players. for McCoy and Ellinger, when those teams were healthy, it was a situational thing. Yes. It wasn't every game. It was ideally, it was like the Red River shootout, the big non-conference game, Big 12 champion, whatever, things like that. Yeah, multiple games where Vince Young carried the ball four times. Yeah. And then against the big opponent, he'd carry it 22 or 18. Yeah. So yeah. let's look at Marcel Reed's usage. All right. This is a chart. Look at those beautiful graphics expertly put together. Uh, I put those together. That's why they look simplistic. Connor would have done this much better. Uh, so here's Marcel Reed's usage with the healthy Moss. So look at the total number of passing attempts. Look at the total number of rushing attempts. Just a nice rule of thumb. We're looking at 30 against Florida total, 41 against Bowling Green. Man, the, 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 the MAC elite tested A&M in, in College Station. 32 against Arkansas and 11 against LSU. He didn't play the entire LSU game. He did kind of come in and, and save the ship when Connor Wegman was, was sinking it. Then Le'Veon Moss blows out his knee. Fairly early in the game against South Carolina. Look at what happened to his usage rate, Ian. 44 total plays against South Carolina. 35 against New Mexico State. That's a game where you should be – he should have 20 plays from scrimmage, right? He should be way yeah. down. You should be resting him. But they had to go out and throw him just to make sure the offense moved. And then lastly against Auburn, this is his biggest usage yet, and it's not a coincidence. Competitive game on the road, went to overtime, 35 passing attempts, 21 rushing attempts, 56 total plays that he was responsible for. That is too much to put on a redshirt freshman, particularly a redshirt freshman who weighs 185 pounds. Colin Klein did a bunch of hero ball at Kansas State as a junior and senior, a redshirt junior and senior, at 6'5", 230. That's a, that's a different thing in kind. So that's the physical part. Let's talk about the mental part. What do we want Marcel Reed doing as much as possible against a pretty smart, pretty capable Texas defense? Making decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Of any kind. Of any kind. Also running between the tackles, but uh, that should also be a – necessary byproduct of if he has to make plays on 40 plus plays in this game. Is it fair to say the AM staff is aware of this and would like to offload as much offense and running as they can to Amari Daniels? You would assume so. Yeah. If they have any faith whatsoever in that. Right. You, you would think that they would go into this game and say, here's our initial script. Here's a couple of the things we're going to try to do. Uh, 
And then failing that, or when we get to the fourth quarter, hero ball. Well, here's an interesting aspect of Marcel Reed's game that may tie in together to the shutting down that running game. And, and it, it actually has some parallels to Kentucky, believe it or not. Even though AM is a better O-line, a better quarterback, better personnel all overall. Maybe not better receivers, though. No. From a, from a clean pocket, Reed is a 64.4% passer who averages 9.1 yards per attempt, 10 touchdowns, one interception. Hmm. And guess what? He's equally effective from a clean pocket on a play action or a straight drop back. Not typical for a dual threat, okay? Here's where it gets interesting, Ian. Under pressure, Reed is a 43% passer who averages five yards per attempt. Two touchdowns, two interceptions, but those two interceptions come in the context of 10% of his passes under pressure hit a defender in the hands. <laughs> they only caught two of them. He also got sacked 20% of the time. Okay. So, Ian, so. is there a game plan here where we want to make him crack under the pressure of high usage and also carry the burden of the offense while also shutting down the running game. Is Pete, is Pete Kwiatkowski going to bring it in College Station? So I've been thinking, like, hey, just play your normal match three zone, have eyes on the quarterback, and just make him work to his second read and and, and just play it safe like that. Your numbers suggest that maybe they should just blitz him early and often and run blitz early and then pass blitz later, right? Yeah. Which they actually did uh, against Cutter Bowley mm -hmm. after he hit a couple plays. Uh, Texas blitzed him a couple times. PK realized that Bowley wasn't really up for handling that if he couldn't get to his primary and he just started bringing like zero blitzes, like every other play. Yep. So it, it is in PK's wheelhouse. It's obviously not what he likes to do as his primary plan. What do you think? I think we're going to bring the heat. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be full on zero blitz, but I think we're going to want to point Anthony Hill downhill. No pun intended. And here's another little juicy fact. Guess who wasn't very good in pass protection for AM? Their offensive line, by the way, is overperformed this year to expectation. But guess who's not good at blocking linebackers in their deep in their offense? Uh the interior. Amari Daniels is a oh. clear pass protector. Oh boy. Oh boy, is right. So I think if AM goes three or four wide, these are auto blitzes. Yeah. And I think we've got the secondary to hold up and be just fine. Uh, if AM had a really high grade wide receiver core, it'd be a little bit more dangerous. But they don't separate early and often. Um, you know, I've noticed that they've done a better job of getting big plays on scramble drills or just, you know, longer, slow developing plays. And I think Texas. The way our edges have been playing and the way Anthony Hill has been getting after the passer, I think that there's going to be a unique formula there of convergence on the football that AM hasn't seen since South Carolina. But Ian, as we're now feeling arrogant and confident about wait, our wait, wait. before we uh before we make that move, what do you think about playing Jelani McDonald at nickel in this game? And just having a little more size and tackling overall. Uh, I'm for it if he can remember what to do. Because I'm okay. at, reviewing Kentucky, I'm pretty convinced he blew two coverages that I could identify. <laughs> okay. So he needs to be on track. Uh, but I love his physicality, his tackling, and obviously he can cover space. I actually – I'd even push back a little. As long as you take away the first read. Yeah. I don't know that a bust matters. Although uh, Reed is good if he can escape the pocket. He's good at having his eyes downfield mm -hmm. and finding something. And uh, But, I mean, that, that can bust open whether it's 
zone or man and you play your assignments right or not. It just, if the play gets extended, then things will break down. So another tidbit about Reed, uh, very good stats inside the hashes, terrible outside the hashes at any distance. And it's not just a hash thing. It transfers to his rollouts. So he throws in front of himself, like, this rotation line of sight really well. If you ask him to throw across the field um, on sort of a touch route, you know, 15 yard out, it's not happening. So we can roll our coverages accordingly. We want to populate the middle of the field. Yep. And then react. You know, a usage rate that's important and that will never let you down. I do. Who? Dave Gabe Winslow. Of course. <laughs> well said. English is your first language. Gabe Winslow. That's right. That's like my mom calls the internet the internet. Uh, <laughs> she puts the emphasis on the wrong word. Gabe is great at what he does. Hey, give thanks to yourself and dial this number. 832-557-1095. Why? Best damn mortgage guy in the great state of Texas. Also, if you're not in Texas, he can help you out in other places as well. Uh, really sharp at what he does. Over 20 years in the industry, also used to own a title company. He knows and understands every aspect of the business. And he's got access to multiple lenders because he's a broker. He's not tied to one bank giving you one rate. He makes these lenders compete with each other and gets you the best possible rate. And then he personally oversees the whole process. He's not, you're not getting shuffled around to a bunch of paper pushers for a big bank who have no skin in the game. They're getting paid whether your mortgage goes through or not. They don't care. Gabe cares. Give him a call. 832-557-1095. So if you're a Texas fan, you're probably feeling pretty good and pretty cheerful about that first half preview that we gave you. But it wouldn't be a great rivalry game if we didn't give you a little bit of insecurity to go with it. And there's another matchup on the other side of the ball. And that matchup is going to be between Mike Elko and the Texas A&M defense versus Steve Sarkeesian, but also versus Quinn Ewers. And Ian... You have a thesis, and I think we both share the thesis, that we want it to be Sark versus Elko and less yours versus Elko. Please expound upon that, Mr. Boyd. Well, I think the best way to do this is with graphic number two, if you would, Mr. Producer. These are Quinn Ewers' uh, passing splits this season based on quarter of play. But I think that's pretty obvious, intuitive. In the first quarter, 73.7% completion percentage. Uh, second quarter goes down to 69.6. I think that's actually a higher YPA, though, slightly. Third quarter slips down a little bit, and you notice that the volume of passes is now decreasing. Fourth quarter, very low completion percentage, very low volume of passes. Now, part of this is that Sark follows the uh, run to win, uh, pass to score, run to win philosophy of the NFL. Mm -hmm. It's easier to run the ball later in the game. It's easier to throw the ball early in the game. You can script stuff up, script open reads, and then lean on a team later when you have a lead and run the ball. So that's obviously at play here as a caveat. But I think it's also apparent that Quinn Ewers, when he's dialing up scripted plays that they've rehearsed in the week and that have been drawn up specifically for that opponent in sequence, is a very different Quinn Ewers than, okay, all the cards are on the table. Now it's time to go make winning plays, Ewers. So I think the point you're making, to, to belabor the obvious perhaps, but it's, this is not just a volume differential. This is a qualitative difference in, in play, right? Yes. You're seeing a 22.4% decline in completion percentage from the first to the fourth quarter. That's a, that's also a uh, – on the fourth quarter, that's a 4.9 yards per attempt. And in the first quarter, that's a 7.7 .7 yards per attempt. Yeah, and the second, he actually is, is as you said, he's, he's better yards per attempt. Yeah, second goes to uh, – and some quick math here. 8.7, actually. That's when he's hitting all his deep balls, Ian. 
yeah, uh, I guess. <laughs> like and then the it just plummets. It, it, the, the, from the second quarter to the fourth quarter is almost halved. Yep. And so you attribute this to sort of comfort zone script being on script. The longer he can stay on script and we can build that lead, the better for Texas because we love staking our defense a lead and we, we don't mind handing off the ball and, and running out the clock and just taking the win. So the idea is that when we're on script, it's Sark versus Elko. When we're off script, it's more Ewers versus Elko. And now Elko's disguises, his blitzes, those sorts of things can come to the fore. Isn't the Occam's razor solution to that, though, Ian, is make hay while the sun shines in the passing game and then run the hell out of the football? Yeah. I, it's the – like the Arkansas game is a really good uh, – I think paints this picture really clearly, which is that after the first two quarters, the score was 10 to zip. But every experienced Texas fan and observer of this program in the Sark era was like, did not score enough points there. Yeah. This well is going to dry up. And what are we going to do if we need to score more points? Which is exactly what happened. I mean, they they eked it out because the run game uh, made it work. Uh, same thing versus Kentucky to a lesser extent. But you just knew that you got to – if you don't score on those opening script plays where you have the defense on their heels, then it's tough to score with this offense later. Agreed. And, hey, the most positive example of this would be the Florida game. They never caught up to our script. Yeah. And it's 42 nothing. And then guess what we did? We just handed the ball off the entire second half and very effectively. And – could have added more points had we felt like it. Uh, we basically just ran out the clock mercifully on, on the Gators. And of course, yeah. they, they go off on a tear after that. Um, and DJ Lagway doesn't play on the defense. So settle down, everybody else in the SEC. Uh, <laughs> ooh, we would only beaten them 49 to 21 if Lagway had started. So um, I think this is a great point, And I think it's an important thing. Um, Ewers is the the vessel for this, but there's other stuff going on in the offense beyond just Ewers. Uh, but the quarterback is going to be the the guy that we're evaluating to demonstrate this. And I think, frankly, it's also Ewers himself. We we can see it in his play and his confidence. Yeah, this is. I mean, if you watch any Sark quarterback over the years, he his quarterbacks are usually much more of a joystick type guy than say uh Ellinger or McCoy or Vince Young. Yep. Where they're making a lot of things happen on their own. And I you wonder also if part of the hits like some people are like Quinn is being dinged up. Why in the world are you not putting Arch in against Kentucky or whatever? And part of it could be I the the joystick is not fully connected on Arch yet. Right. He doesn't have quite the reps to operate the full volume of offense that Quinn can operate. You know, an interesting thing, the Aggie defense has been vulnerable at times. People have been able to run on them. People have been able to throw deep on them. They've given up explosives, even though they're pretty good down to down. Yeah. One of the common traits, though, of those offenses is big, strong, mobile quarterbacks who are accurate and big arm deep. Uh, Lenore Sellers killed A&M. He didn't just kill him throwing the ball down the field, which he did, or handing it to Rocket Sanders, which he did. He shrugged off five or six different sacks in the yeah. pocket where an Aggie defender had him wrapped up and Lenore Sellers would just go, get off me, and then take off running or throw the ball 60 yards down the field. Uh, Peyton Thorne, in his own way, did some similar things. Um, very effective throwing the ball deep, specifically on fades to uh, Cam Coleman know that we can duplicate that but does that expose some other aspects of the Aggie defense that maybe we can duplicate that success in a different way maybe yeah uh if Texas could hit some fades on the outside in this game there is a 
you could target Des Ricks or uh, Javen Thomas. The Will Lee, I think, is better not to go after him if you don't have to. Um, and then uh, slot fades. Producer is, is making a negative commentary in the comments that you can't see. But in our, fact... Our producer is skeptical. Our producer is skeptical. In fact, Quinn has actually thrown some pretty good fade balls this year. Um, he had like two that DeAndre Moore dropped, right? Against Florida. Yep. yep. Especially on the slot fade. I think that's a more comfortable throw for Quinn. Another advantage of the fade is that it's like the first read on a three-step drop. So it's like you drop back. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, you just let it go and throw the ball up and let him run under it, which I think plays to Quinn's strengths. Anything deep where uh, you need time for the play to develop and you need good extra good protection because you're not sure if Quinn's going to be moving very well, I, I, I don't like it in this game because this is a very good pass rush. Very good defensive line, very good blitz package. And that's just doubling down on negative advantage areas to ask Quinn to try to hit like a post route against this team. I'll say this, um, two things. A&M, um, good blitz packages, well coached. I mean, Elko, de Elko defenses are well coached, generally speaking. Although he's offloaded some of the play calling to Jay Bateman, clearly. Um their linebackers, not super mobile, not laterally quick. That's a problem for them because Quinn Ewers is extraordinary at throwing swing passes. Uh, if those linebackers, if they're running certain blitz packages trying to bring a safety or a nickel, they're guarding Gunner Helm. They can't guard him. So that's another factor. And then finally, I'd say this. AM's defensive line is good. They're very physical. They're very big. And they're power rushers. Yeah. How have we fared against higher level power rushing defensive lines? Power rushers. Hey, which Michigan. Ones Kentucky. Yeah. How is our protection in those? Do we do we have guys who just get driven back into the quarterback? Or did we struggle a little bit with Georgia's quickness and their, their blitz packages and guys coming from different places? Seemed like everything was a problem against Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can say I didn't see a ton of guys getting driven back and thrown into the quarterback. Not in and, the not in the past game. And where I've seen AM be effective, particularly as pure pass rushers, is third and eight. And they just they relocate the pocket into the lap of your quarterback. And he he wilts. Um, I've not seen a lot of teams do that to our offensive line. So yeah. that will be an interesting matchup. I, I would I think I worry more about the uh the play where they sim a pressure and then they get a linebacker running up the middle on the running back. Mm -hmm. And then how Quinn reacts to that, even if it's blocked. Yeah, do you drop your eyes? Do you pull the ball down? Like yeah. or do you take a step to, you know, a half foot to the side, step forward and throw the ball. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a big part of it. That's why we have horse races. That's why we have differences of opinion about who's going to win this game. Uh, I think you can make arguments for both. Obviously a &M has the home field advantage, uh, but I think a and I think Texas has a lot of discrete advantages that may be more subtle and then you got to dig deep. You know, Marcel Reed has been a godsend for a and I think he salvaged their season. But if you dig a little deeper, if you dive a little deeper, I think that Marcel Reed has some game planning issues that the right defense, which I think Texas has, can execute and make him have a very long four quarters. I also, I think that, I think the Aggies are going to park their safety shallow and try to rely on them to clean up the horizontal game that Texas is so good at. Um, but I still think there's going to be opportunities in the opening script or if they can use tempo to bust some plays on those anyway. And maybe for big plays, if the safeties are shallow and then you get behind them on a uh, Isaiah Bond 
uh, slant or something. To that point, an overreported aspect of this game, Quinn Ewer's <laughs> ankle. An underreported aspect of this game, Isaiah Bond's ankle. It's not been right for some time. He's been mostly a decoy. We need that ankle to heal up. Uh, we got to get it taped up and take a shot and see if we can get some Isaiah Bond speed because I can tell you a and they don't have a single guy in their cover in, in their secondary, even Will Lee who can just run with him. That's not going to happen. All right. We'll yep. let that nod be your closing thoughts as you look like a Easter Island Moai. Uh, for so overall, overall, how confident are you? Would you, what's the spread? It's now five and a half. Would you, uh, what would you take if you had to make a call? I have Texas A&M plus nine and a half. Well, sure. And I'm waiting to for this to get to four and a half, and then I'm going to take Texas and try to middle it and have, have Texas win by seven or six. So you think Texas wins by maybe a touchdown? That's the hope. I'll take a one-point victory. Don't care. Right. I, I think I'm in a similar boat. The, the game I'm – I mean, you you don't want to count your uh, eggs until they hatch, but the one that scares me is the one after. Actually, you can count your eggs before they hatch. What's you the can't count your chickens before they hatch, Ian. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to count the eggs either. It's a rivalry. <laughs> He's not counting anything. <laughs> He's going to be conservative. He's not so even sure the eggs are there. One. Perfect. All right. Well, on that note, happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you guys. Hook of horns.